<laughs> That's true. That was wonderful timing. Hello <laughs> and welcome. My name is Mark Horseman, Data Evangelist with Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Key Elements of a Successful Data Governance Program. It is the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section. If you would like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. To open the Q&A or the chat panel, you may find the icons for those features in the bottom middle of your screen. To answer the most commonly asked question, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording. And we'll also send a link to the recording of this session, as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce you to our speaker for today, my good friend, Dr. Peter Aiken. Dr. Peter Aiken is an Acknowledged Data Management Authority and Associate Professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, President of DEMA International and Associate Director of the MIT International Society of Chief Data Officers. For more than 40 years, Peter has learned from working with hundreds of data management practices in more than 30 countries. Among his 12 books are the first on making the case for data leadership, the first focusing on data monitoring monetization and modern strategic data thinking, and the first to objectively specify what it means to be data literate. International recognition has resulted from these and a pre-COVID intensive worldwide events schedule. Peter also hosts the longest running data management webinar series on dataversity.net, this one right here. Before Google, before data was big, and before data science, Peter founded several organizations that have helped more than 200 businesses leverage data. Specific savings have been measured at more than $1.5 billion. His latest venture is anything awesome. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello, Mark. It's such a pleasure to be with you again. And hello to everybody else out there. Our topic today, of course, is successful data governance programs and what are the key elements that should be a part of that. Uh, Mark, look forward to joining you at the top of the hour and uh, we'll get into our Q&A section, but for right now, let's dive into the program. <clears throat> so first thing we're going to take a look at is just a little bit of important uh, ground setting in that data does have some confounding characteristics and it's important to recognize as a data governance professional that you are dealing with something that is not as easy to describe as a manufacturing product or a service. Uh, the four key elements that you need to have to get your data governance program to be successful is number one, keeping data governance practically focused on strategy. And by that, of course, I mean the things that matter to the people who are in the corner office and or funding your projects uh, around that. Second element is that data governance must exist in your organization at the same level that your HR department exists in your organization. And the reason for that is because both are programs. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail. Number three, it is key to start small and grow. I know that sounds trite, but I see so many organizations that simply try too much in the planning efforts uh, around this. And I'll talk about some specific ones, not trying to embarrass anybody, but again, to learn from their mistakes, uh, lessons that they've learned, et cetera, et cetera. And the fourth key element of a successful data governance program is get everybody in the business of telling stories. Because only through stories do people really learn what we're trying to do how we're trying to do it and why it is that we need to do what we do in data governance. As I mentioned a second ago, again, Mark will be joining us at the top of the hour and uh, we'll look forward to your questions and answers. Uh, sometimes you guys are able to stump us chumps and uh, Mark and I always enjoy that process. So one of the things I like to do when we're doing these kind of educational sessions is to ask and see how ChatGPT or whatever the various uh, AI of your choice are illustrating these things. And so uh, most recently I had some last year that looked not very good, but this one this year looks a little bit better, still kind of 
off though, key elements of a successful data governance program. We should probably hold a contest to see uh, if you guys can come up with things as well, but at least we understand that it's making this uh, effort uh, in order to do this. And probably one of the reasons for that is because data is not broadly or widely understood. Uh, I've been teaching this subject for more than 40 years. And quite frankly, the curriculums in college, university, even high school have not kept up with what's happening out there on the market. Uh, first of all, just to approach data in general, it's like the blind individuals approaching an elephant. Uh, some people grab the ears and they say it's a fan. Somebody grabs the, snake, the nose and said it's a snake. Somebody else grabs the leg and says it's a tree. Somebody grabs the tail and says it's a rope. And another person encounters the side of the elephant and discovers that it's a wall. Of course, the, the elephant's probably not going to stand for all that unwelcome touching uh, around the whole process anyway. And we'll squash all these people just uh, out of... Uh, you know, more normal elephant behavior. But if we translate that into data, people approach data from different perspectives and therefore they think of data in a completely different context, each one of them. And that is a, a challenge for us. And it's something that we need to work on. What this means to you, however, is that in your organization, there is unlikely to be a unified perspective of what data is and how it contributes to the organization's success. And that's something that you as a data governance professional are going to have to uh, overcome. I'll just take a quick side note here too, and note that Mark and I were both in San Diego last week for the annual uh, Data Governance West conference and had a marvelous time and saw a bunch of topics, but also we saw, I think the same confusion. Mark, you can comment on that when we get back to the uh, uh, Q&A section at the end here. The key with all this, though, is that there is still confusion as to data's responsibility. IT thinks data is a business problem, and their attitude is if they can connect to the server, then my job is done. Now, I say that in general. About one in 10 CIO shops actually do a terrific job of working with the data. So I hope that you have the fortune of working for one of those, but if you don't, uh, you're probably based with the, the, the first piece that I have up there. Secondly, business thinks that IT is managing the data for them. And uh, after all, there is a, a, a person there with a title chief information officer who else would be taking care of that. And what that means is that data has fallen into this enormous gap between business and IT. And it's our job as data governance professionals to get these two groups to work together, restore the common perspective on data as a business asset and uh, uh, move forward from that perspective. Because most people don't understand that data is very much like the story of Hans Christian Andersen's uh, princess on the P. The P is of course down here at the bottom of the slide, you can see it. Uh, that P in the story is causing the princess up here at the top to be sleepless. And uh, in the instance of data, badly done data permeating our organization means that the princess will probably be sleepless forever in that. And, and doing a poor job with data governance really results in failure around proposed and existing software and services. If you acquire the wrong set of softwares or software that is not in fact complementary to your existing information architecture, then you will lock in these imperfections for the life of the application. And that means a lot of discomfort, uh, what Tom uh, uh, Redmond calls uh, our hidden data factories that are out there in our organizations. These are places where the organization is spending more money than it has to, and it's costing more, taking longer, delivering less, and presenting greater risk to the organization around all of this. It means that your future data investment benefits are restricted uh, because you're gonna spend much more of your time doing things to correct things as opposed to actually doing things that exploit your data. Uh, again, in the military, this would be called the tooth to tail ratio because it decreases the organizational data leverage opportunities. And of course, leveraging data is an engineering concept that really is in fact what we need 
to be focusing on in our organizations. Uh, if everybody creates their own piles of data, we're re running uh, really redundant types of operations. I'll show you some very specifics on that in just a few more slides. But what this means is that organizations are spending 20 to 40% of their IT budgets with stand in the gears, uh, accounting for data migration, data conversion, and data improvement. Now, just look at your organization's IT budget as a whole and think what would be the opportunities for our organization if I was, in fact, able to trim 20 to 40% off of those budgets and deliver more products and services as a result of that. Lack of data governance causes everything else to take longer, causes everything else to cost more, costs uh, causes everything else to deliver less and causes greater risk to the organization. Thank you, Tom DeMarco, of course, for those cogent words in order to do that. One of the primary challenges that you have as a data governance professional is what we call the process of separating the wheat from the chaff. In most places, people, at least from an agricultural perspective, understand that not all the things that come out of the wheat are going to be useful. And you may, in fact, have to convince people that well-organized data is, in fact, worth more than poorly organized data. If you have trouble with that as an example, here's a great way to ask them to think about it. Before the information age was there, we used the term metadata when we were working and putting together collections of data. We call them books. And imagine being handed a book that had no page numbers, that the index was not in an alphabetical order, that didn't have a table of contents or lists of indices, lexicons, maps, diagrams, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this example, by the way, is from a, a colleague, Abby Covert, who I've put a couple of links out there to some of her wonderful YouTube uh, things. And her book is called How to Make Sense of Any Mess. It is really anything, uh, excuse me, information architecture for the non-IT person. A wonderful piece that's available on Kindle. Uh, and many of you have Kindle subscriptions in your organization. You can simply go look for it, find it, and download it uh, in order to do this. Uh, again, Abby's point here is that, of course, if you took the spine off the book, remove the page numberings, the metadata, the data becomes ephemeral very, very quickly. So hopefully that will help you convince your colleagues that data that is better organized is in fact worth more uh, from a value perspective. And that is of course, one of the primary things that you're doing in the organization is helping to ensure that organization-wide the data is organized better. Because of course, poor data management practices cost our organization lots of time, money, and effort. And 80%, I'm absolutely certain of this figure, of the data in your organizations is ROT. ROT is an acronym standing for data that is redundant, obsolete, or trivial. And that means that you are trying to spend five times as much as you really need to spend in order to manage your data. But of course, the question is, just like advertising, everybody knows that half of all advertising dollars are uh, wasted. But of course, nobody knows which have to eliminate. Most organizations are not comfortable with going out and just eliminating data piles wholesale. That once again is a major task for data governance professionals that are out there. But it is a good place to start when you say that most enterprise data is in fact never even analyzed. It sits there in databases and nothing else happens to it. Now, I get some pushback on this, but the only pushback I get is that some people come to me and say, my organization, the number is closer to 90%, uh, which means you really are spending a lot of time and effort finding things and in fact, not actually operating on the data that you need to operate on. The question that occurs to you as perhaps getting to governance professionals is who is best qualified to accomplish this? Well, again, I'm talking to a group of roughly a thousand of you right now who are better qualified to do this than almost anybody else on the planet and should in fact be focusing your efforts into this area. Let's take another concept in here for you to deal with as data governance professionals and that is the concept of data debt. Once again, data debt slows progress, decreases quality, 
increases costs, presents greater risks all the way around in our organizations. And our colleague Tom Redmond came up with a wonderful term for this. Uh, he calls them hidden data factories, where they are in our organizations all around, but we don't know it. We're correcting things that we shouldn't have to correct that somebody else should have caught the first time uh, in order to do this. I urge you to look up some of Tom's writing. He's been putting stuff, stuff in the Harvard Business Review, which is some of the highest visibility uh, that we have of these topics in the data area. So many organizations, you're going to have to spend some time just eliminating data debt before you can start moving forward in this, which likely involves undoing some existing stuff and discovering, unfortunately, that new skills are required in your organization in order to make sense out of all of this. Because, of course, data debt isn't easy to visualize. And what that means is, once again, slower, decreasing quality, increasing costs, and, of course, greater risks to the organization. Because it's not visible, most people don't really understand it. The real question then for you all as data governance professionals is oftentimes the wrong question. People will start, I'll see data strategies that say we're going to govern all our data better. After what I've just told you, no. What your first question should be is, should we include this data item, this data table, this data set, within the scope of our current data governance practices? That's the first question, because if you try to govern all of it, you're doing much redundant stuff. You're doing things that are governing, things that should actually be eliminated via data debt, elimination routines, et cetera, et cetera. And regardless of what decision you come to in this process, document why, so that everybody else is able to follow your logic around this. So let's dive a little closer into this and talk about data governance as focused on strategy. Now, when I ask what is the world's oldest profession, people should understand the joke there is the accounting profession. For 8,000 plus years, we as human beings have been selling alcoholic beverages to each other. In fact, that's what those clay tablets in the middle show, our beer sales back in uh, Egyptian times. These have resulted in something that works very, very well for the accounting profession called GAP or generally accepted accounting principles. We in the data world are much less mature. In fact, if we go back to our founding mother in this case, Augusta Ada King, the Countess of Loveless, uh, looked at a weaving loom sometime in the early 1800s and said, oh my goodness, the weaving looms that she looked at, by the way, were quite large. Uh, I could uh, actually turn that into mathematics when somebody finally gets around to inventing the computer. So maybe 250 years, if we really stretch, we have in this. That's not a lot compared to the 8,000 years that accounting has been around, but nevertheless still is something that we need to mature faster in order to do this. And our good colleagues, Randy Bean and Tom Davenport, have been doing wonderful surveys. Again, the uh, 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 URL for it is right here at the bottom of your slide, newvantage.com. These are the most recent year's worth of uh, results from them. This is the first year in the years they've been doing this survey that more people are driving innovation with data. This is all self-reported, but nevertheless, it's still 60% are saying that they are driving innovation with data, but less than 40 per, excuse me, 41% are saying that they are competing on data and analytics. 40% uh, uh, managing data as a business asset, 25% one in four creating a data-driven organization and one in five forging a data-driven culture. So in spite of everything that we talk about and data being clearly a key asset, uh, for organizations, we're largely not succeeding in these areas. The most important finding, however, from all of these surveys, looking longitudinally at them, Tom and Randy asked the question also, are your technology problems primarily, excuse me, are your data problems primarily technology focused or primarily people and process focused? In 2018, it was clearly 80-20, and uh, the results have followed very much the same suit going all the way through to 2022, once again, 
five times as many people and process problems reported as technology problems. This is again a key data governance finding. Where else in your organization do you have resources devoted to helping with the people and process problems around data? Data governance is the only resource that addresses those challenges. Let's get to some definitional material now. In the world of corporations, there is a concept that has long been established called corporate governance. Uh, interestingly, Jamie Dimon and several others about five years ago came up and said, you know, maybe it isn't all about the bottom line. Uh, we'll see how that sticks, but uh, nevertheless, everybody in corporations agrees there should be corporate governance. Of course, if we have corporate governance, we should talk about IT governance as well. And I'll highlight just a couple of things on this very wordy slide, which is aligning IT strategy with business, providing some measures around how IT is doing, key metrics, and what sort of return IT is investing in the business. Uh, there are pri primarily five focus uh, areas around the strategic alignment, value delivery, resource management, risk management, and performance measures. Uh, again, if people had performed more IT governance, we probably would see a lot less invested in ERPs and other types of failed IT initiatives that if somebody invests 10 million in, it's very difficult to show that you would have in fact saved significant amounts of money or added more to the top line around this. So we've talked about corporate IT governance. Let's talk about data governance. And here are seven definitions that are primarily the founding definitions that we've used over time on this. And quite frankly, I don't like any of them. I Hopefully I didn't jar anybody from that because it's really not helpful. Imagine getting on an elevator and trying to explain to them about key controls and uh, aspects and things like that. If you get on the elevator and the boss looks over at you and says, oh, you're part of that data governance stuff. What is it that you do? The answer should be quite simply managing our data with guidance. The implication being, of course, if you're not doing data governance, you are managing your data without guidance, and that's probably not a good idea. Similarly, as you move up the food chain in your organization, I add another word here, and that is managing data decisions with guidance, because most managers are not aware when they make decisions that are bad data decisions. Let's take a look at this next example here in particular. Lots of organizations make bad decisions, make bad decisions based on inaccurate data. And this leads to something that I call the bad data decisions spiral. Bad, uh, excuse me, decision makers are not data knowledgeable and technical decision makers are also not technically knowledgeable. Consequently, they make bad data decisions. Those bad data decisions then result in poor treatment of organizational assets and poor quality data. That results in bad organizational outcomes. How can we go through the process of avoiding the lather, rinse, and repeat cycle? I love sampling Morgan Freeman in here. He says, this is wrong. Yes, absolutely, this is wrong. And the most egregious example that has been easy for most people to visualize here is that over the past uh, five years or so, I have about 25 organizations that have told me that they installed Salesforce. Salesforce is perfectly good software. However, if Salesforce is installed and we have to turn it on, say, by July 1st to meet an arbitrary IT deadline, three things happen in that process. We eliminate the testing, we eliminate the training, and we eliminate the transformation of the data, which means Salesforce good software is filled up with bad quality data. And unfortunately, organizations cannot determine the difference between Salesforce being bad and Salesforce being filled with bad data. This is actually a number one problem at Salesforce, but nevertheless, they still have not managed to help organizations overcome that particular activity. This leads us to three data governance questions that are pretty interesting. Is the quality of the data in new systems forecast to be better quality than the data in the old system? Because lifting and shifting does not improve the data quality. One something you should, as part of data governance, fight against with tooth and nail. Are we then able to formulate plans to obtain significant new value 
from the new system. If not, we're lacking specificity around our requirements. And third, does this afford us an opportunity to consolidate data and data types? Many of the systems meet the requirement, but looking at an opportunity to simplify the environment provides much additional value. Let me give you an example very uh, quickly here, this occurred during the pandemic, Forbes article again referenced to it at the bottom there, where they looked at American Airlines and United Airlines and found that both of them were market, excuse me, valued a market value wise at six and nine billion dollars respectively, but that the data in the American Airlines Advantage program, their frequent flyer program, and the data in the United Airlines mileage program were valued at 10 or 20 times more than the actual airline itself. What this means is that a competent CEO who was competent in the data area should in fact be selling the airline to somebody else for $6 billion and keeping just the $30 billion of American Airlines Advantage data. But guess what? They may see it's valued that way, but they don't know how to extract that value. How do they unlock that 24 billion in Americans case and 13 billion in United Airlines case in data value. And they're still struggling with it. Because when we look at what happens, your organization should be viewed as an organizational data machine. And that all the inputs to the machine are data and all of the outputs are data. Yes, some of you make products and some of you sell services, but in general, the market is moving towards this. And if we do too much, management of the data formally, it becomes expensive and slow. And if we do too little, we miss opportunities. In the case of interoperability, this is where we can determine our primary value on this. And if all of the outputs are data, what we're trying to do as a data steward or a data uh, management professional is to understand more of the data, reducing the unknown space and increasing the known space. And as we do that, we're also looking for opportunities to shrink entirely the set of data down, making everybody's job faster, better, cheaper, and less risky. This, of course, should be done in governance with an eye towards strategy. Strategy, unfortunately, is a term that wasn't used in the business world before 1950, when management consultants discovered it and discovered they could sell everybody lots and lots of PowerPoints and words on a page that fortunately didn't actually help. Uh, I like to go back and look at the original definition, which originated in the military, which means that the current use of the word strategy in the military is a pattern in a stream of decisions. Now that is a much more useful thing, which means that data strategy is a process, whereas most people look at this as data strategy being a thing. It's an important distinction. Let me give you three quick examples. Walmart's former business strategy was very simple. All of you know it. Every day low price. They were so successful with this strategy that you couldn't sit on an airplane headed for Bentonville, Arkansas without at least hearing three people repeat this phrase. Every associate in the stores knew this. If you made a decision in Walmart and you erred on the side of everyday low price, Walmart would never take you for some wood shedding, some discipline uh, around that process. Again, a pattern in a stream of decisions. Another definition of strategy comes from Wayne Gretzky. If you're not familiar with ice hockey, he's got a wonderful Wikipedia page where he describes the origin of where he came up with his definition of strategy, which is that he skates to where he thinks the puck will be. After all, if you're skating on the ice and chasing a very dense piece of plastic, it's going to outperform you in all cases. So you can't hope to chase it. You can only hope to be where you think it's going to be and be able to score in that instance. Third example here, if we're the good guys on the left and the bad guys are on the right, uh, we're gonna have a different strategy than if the good guys are up here at the top of the hill and the bad guys are down here at the bottom, or oppositely, we'll have the bad guys at the top and good guys at the bottom. Each of these are going to require a different strategy. A hundred PowerPoint pages are not going to help anybody. A hundred pieces 
uh, excuse me, pages of Word documents are not going to help people. Again, strategy should be a pattern in a stream of decision. And more importantly, strategy or perceived strategy is what guides work group activities. Let me give you an example of how difficult this is. This is the Commonwealth of Virginia, where I reside, have resided my entire life. And they've trying their third time to do a data governance initiative. They've done a good job, but it, as I said before, it's a third time, which means there's been some uh, trials that haven't worked out so well. And this is a complex data governance structure. It's too complex for an organization the size of the Commonwealth of Virginia with 146 agencies. Imagine trying to explain this to the governor of the state of Virginia, what all of these pieces do and why they need to have it. It looks to them just like an additional bureaucracy and has succeeded not very well in each instance in here. So your data strategy then should be the highest level of data guidance available, focusing on data activities, excuse me, focusing data activities on business goal achievement and providing guidance when faced with a stream of decisions or uncertainty. Data strategy articulates how data can best be used to support the organization's strategy. And as I mentioned before, it involves a balance of remediation and proactive measures. A lighthouse provides a good metaphor on this. There are lots of things you could do that would further strategy, but there are only some subset of those things that will further organization strategy that will also help you improve data as it's used by the business and still smaller, a subset of things that will help you develop skills in your organization. And that's really the sweet spot that you should be looking for to find where can I, in fact, make my first forays in data governance in a way that provides this. I mentioned the hidden data factories before. Again, this is where work products are delivered to Department A that should have been corrected by, excuse me, B, that should have been corrected by Department A. And similarly, Department C doing it here. If we add the customer in the loop, in this just fine little example, there are three different hidden data factories that are there, problematic all the way around. And these hidden data factories really help us understand that poor data quality manifests itself as multifaceted organizational challenges. And those challenges really do always show up through some combination of IT systems or business challenges. And that only when we take a step back and try to see the forest for the trees, we will understand that there's a common data cause to all of these things. All business challenges have data as a part of their root cause. And that root cause analysis is an important part of data governance, meaning that you should have a team that is focused on eliminating data debt first, and then second, trying to improve your data. And that team will benefit from specialized skills and dedicated resources to develop and deploy a repeatable process to provide sustained organizational skill sets. Organizational strategy, I've already mentioned, should be focused on how data is best used to support the organizational strategy. Are we measuring the right things is a question that comes up often. And from that perspective, what data assets do to support better data strategy is what data governance should be focused on and how well is that strategy working. So a very tight link there, focusing the data governance efforts on what is elements of the data strategy. And of course, then we implement this with data stewards. What's the most effective use of our stewards in that larger equation? In the process, we're going to focus our data governance efforts on business goals, and the language of data governance should be metadata based, and those should be part of the stewards' roles in there, learning how to do all of this. Organizations starting out on a data governance journey. They do this with a trusted catalog. The glossary is almost always one of the first pieces that you pick up to start working at. And if we look at this, we have sort of some data leadership and some nascent feedback around this, perhaps augmented by a trusted catalog. By the way, your trusted catalog can be as simple as a single web page with definitions on it. You don't need to spend five, six, seven, eight figures on a data governance catalog in order to get started uh, with this. By the way, they're called glossaries, they're called data banks, they're called encyclopedias. They're all the same thing. We're trying to provide a common vocabulary for people. 
And that people do realize that data governance over time will create a series of policies that will help data improve over time, but they also realize that that is a slower, perhaps, process than they would like it to be. And quickly, organizations then realize that they have to move to something that is faster, better, and cheaper, uh, typically doing in parallel with the good work that you do at the policy level, some specific focused data improvement projects. And that improves the data as a result of a conscious focus, a much more proactive approach to it than the reactive or the wait for it process that occurs with data governance. This will result in increased feedback and the ability to put in place the structure that you need to have to implement your data governance initiatives. We've gotten very, very good at understanding and celebrating when data things happen. But notice I'm using the approximately equal sign there. We're not quite as good. We haven't been quite as good at translating that into organizational things that happen. So, well, it's good to celebrate that data things happen until we put a dollar sign on it and quantify it. Everybody else kind of pats us on the head and says, that's really, really nice. This is, in fact, the scope of stewardship efforts in most organizations trying to quantify. And those dollars, by the way, will help to drive your organizational priorities. Now, I mentioned this sort of dual nature here. I like to uh, say it's a firehouse metaphor. Uh, we all know that the firemen sit around. Harmless. If you're not a MacGyver fan, you ought to be, because they sit around the firehouse not waiting for fires. They, in fact, do fire education prevention, make sure that you have batteries in your smoke detectors, talk to kids about this sort of thing. It's very much of a dual nature, the same way as data governance is of a dual nature. And your data governance efforts, when they are being implemented at the reactive level, are going to look a lot like MacGyver types of efforts. Data governance is important because organizations spend millions a year and lose millions a year in productivity, in redundant and siloed efforts, in poorly thought out hardware and software purchases, delayed decision-making using inadequate information, reactive and being instead of being proactive. And again, I'll remind you of that 20 to 40% of IT spending in this. These are huge numbers, and this is where data governance can help in most organizations. So our first piece here is keeping data governance practically focused on strategy. Our second is making sure the data governance initiative is situated at the correct level in the organization. Data is not a project. I keep getting asked, when are you going to be done? Uh, the answer is probably never in the general sense, but that IT has become good at creating new organizational capabilities, but evolving our data operates at a different cadence, a different rhythm, a different time frame, And so the data programs have to be extracted from the existing IT programs and should in fact drive because data evolution is separate from its external and it precedes system development activities. These two have never worked together well. And this is a big challenge for most organizations. IT correctly is a project-driven organization, but data is a program. The difference between data governance and data management is often one that people need. So I created a slide to show that data governance is a policy level guidance, setting general directions and guidelines, but don't forget that you need to do the reactive things, the proactive things I described earlier in here as well, the firehouse metaphor for this. Data management, however, is the business function planning, controlling, and delivering information assets and making data available to solve specific business challenges. There's a real problem with all of this though, and that is external comprehension. While we in the data community love to talk about data stuff and data management as distinct from data governance, important distinctions that we can make, the rest of the world just hears the Charlie Brown teacher noise. They don't appreciate the difference and don't try and teach it to them. Just call it all part of your data program in general. Again, the idea of projects and programs 
wonderful slide here that I pulled from the Project Management Institute's uh, guidance on this. The key is you will no longer need your data program when you no longer need your HR program, when you're ready to close up your doors. Nobody's going to say, hey, HR, I think we don't need you anymore. Everybody's going to behave. No, your HR program is a permanent part of your organization. By the way, just a quick note on that. About 100 years ago, HR was done the same way as data. Everybody did it on their own, and then corporations figured out that their risk and the results were much better with a centralized approach than a distributed approach around this. If you haven't heard of the DIMBOK, or uh, poorly named, I have to take responsibility for that, but uh, nevertheless, maybe somebody can help us with some marketing efforts. The DIMBOK shows these efforts and data governance, of course, is absolutely central to this. But most people look at the guidance and they think I've got to do one or all of these things. Probably the number three is more useful when you're looking at starting your data governance initiatives. Think of it as a three-legged stool. And the idea is that we may start out working on an initiative that involves some data warehousing and some data quality and some data governance. You get one experience point for each of those. But that then over time, you're likely to move around and say, we need to put some time and effort into metadata management. Notice we've got two experience points in data governance and data warehousing now, but we're now starting to get some experience in uh, metadata. The last one, of course, focuses on reference and master data. This is really a better way to use all of these because it does give you a different approach rather than trying to take them as silos. Uh, that's probably due to us presenting them as silos. Again, I'm willing to uh, take ideas. We're getting ready to get started on the DIMBOK version three. And so we are uh, got sign up sheets for people to get involved in this and look forward to your participation. Seriously, if you are interested in that, please just drop me an email and I will get you on the list uh, to be contacted for that. The key for all of this, because data has been part of IT and IT is largely project driven, we've looked at it as strategy, IT projects, and then data and information. This, of course, once again, is wrong. This is wrong. Thank you, Morgan Freeman. We think about data strategy as starting out with our organizational strategy, our IT strategy, and then our data strategy. It does not give us the ability to do things because by the time you assemble this data, is wrong into a coherent project at the bottom of this pyramid, uh, it's too fragmented to make sense correctly. Instead, you should look at it as IT strategy and data strategy to being developed parallel, but that the data strategy influences the IT strategy more than the IT strategy influences the data strategy, which means all we have to change is just that. Now, that's a non-trivial piece. I'm going to do it one more time just so that you see how easy it is to rearrange things on PowerPoint. But of course, changing it from your organizational perspective is really a goal of data governance that you have to pay attention to in there. So your data governance must exist at the same level of HR, and that's why you need to change so many fundamental things in your organization in order to get it to work. Number three of the key elements to successfully implementing a data governance program are practicing and getting better. Uh, there's a digital insight that our friend uh, Mark Johnson put together a while ago. Uh, he was doodling in a Zoom session during the pandemic, but I, I still think is a great example. He said, you know, I, I don't know what happens if you subtract data from digital, but I do know that if you subtract digital from data, you still are left over with the data. I thought that was a brilliant insight because of course you can't just move digital. And I should point out here a quick sub uh, division subroutine, here we go, <laughs> that. Uh, there are about twice as many chief digital officers out there as there are chief data officers. That's an unfortunate occurrence, and it means that people are starting with digital, whereas they probably aren't going to have much results. Because, of course, you can't go digital without by just spelling data. It doesn't work that way. There's always some little random person in Nebraska, if you haven't seen this meme before, uh, that's gonna get a mess into your plans. It requires a lot more work on the analysis side. When you look at actually what's happening out there, we see organizations taking this garbage data and it doesn't matter what they've got in the middle here. Uh, my license plate says G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. If it's a model, that's great. If it's a data warehouse, you have the same thing. If it's machine learning, business intelligence, blockchain, AI, MDM, it doesn't matter what you're doing here. It's still garbage in, garbage out. And only by correcting 
the data and getting quality to the point where it is in fact much more accessible and usable in order to do this, can you now start to do two important steps? The first one is to harmonize your data flows. I can't tell you all how much of that one and a half billion dollars that I've saved organizations comes from uh, reducing your cloud bills. But if you're sending data in and out and you're doing the same data each time, just harmonizing those, those bills will oftentimes pay much greater results than you'd be expecting to. However, in addition to that, once we've harmonized the results, now we can only now start to measure the actual pieces that come on the right-hand side of it. And the most important aspect of this is machine learning. So many organizations are simply wasting money doing machine learning, going out and getting new data sets, whereas what they should be doing instead is looking at their existing data sets to see what's actually out there. So these machine learning efforts are widely unsuccessful. Uh, I'm not at my home right now. Uh, I'm actually up in Washington, D.C., but I'll hope to be home later this evening. And uh, the foundation, of course, now has a barn on top of it. Why did I take pictures of my barn's foundation? Well, it's critical to have a framework. The barn, however, was built with money borrowed from the bank. And before they would allow any further construction to proceed, I had to pass a barn foundation inspection. If I didn't pass the foundation inspection, the bank wasn't going to give me any more money, which means they were gonna have a better quality barn on top of a good foundation, just one way of making good business sense. But there is no IT equivalent. Another reason why we have to take data out of the IT stack in most organizations, with the exception of those 10% that I mentioned, excuse me, at the top of the hour. The frameworks that you put in place on these foundations are a system of ideas, guiding analyses. They organize project data, make decisions, help us understand that you don't put up the wall until the foundation is, is a past inspection and that you should put the roof on pretty fast after that so that you can keep working in inclement weather. There are a number of data governance foundations. I have all of these out there on my website. Of course, you'll get them as copies of the slides here as well. Uh, I'm going to flip through them because they're not worth discussing at this point. Uh, although Bob Siner, thanks for the update on yours. He gave me that just last week at the conference. But it is worthwhile to go back and look at your organization and see which of these, if any, are useful to bring in. Again, as I mentioned, they're up there on my website. You can take a look at them and they have links to where the uh, official uh, sources come from on this. Looking at a data governance foundation, it of course is grounded in the capabilities provided by IT. So while I've been picking on IT, we have to have them there a necessary partner in order to do this. On the left-hand side of this quadrant diagram that I'm gonna build for you, the domain expertise is less and the roles are more formally defined. Obviously on the opposite side, they are opposite. And on the upper side of this brown line in the quadrant diagram, you're more likely to encounter governed data less directly, whereas if on the bottom side, you're going to encounter governed data more directly, and that the people on the bottom half of this chart are going to be able to put more time dedicated to those processes. So let's take a look at these uh, four quadrants and how they interact. Oh, excuse me, we have leadership, we have stewards, we have participants and experts, our subject matter experts, our SMEs, and our other data users that are involved in this process. Most organizations draw a line around the left-hand side of this diagram and decide that's what their data organization, it's gonna be data governance organization is going to comprise of, and that we have uh, resources that come into this uh, data and feedback that comes around it, uh, decisions that are made, push to the stewards for implementation, who then take action around that to the rest of the organization so that everybody else can participate in this. Uh, they get some feedback, they uh, get ideas back into the stewardship, and again, we go back for our guidance. So this is a way to think about this. I wouldn't show the diagram at this level to people. I would simplify it and show it to them just like this. Now, when you're getting started with data governance, this is sort of the typical process that most organizations go through. And unfortunately, I see them agonize over this. Oh my God, I've got to get this right. I don't want to say you don't have to get it right, but 
80% will definitely do a bunch because most of the guidance around this talks about how to define goals and principles. I'm not going to read these. They come all over your package. What sort of primary deliverables you should have, roles and responsibilities, scorecard, how are we going to do this? What are the checklists that we're going to need in place? What are the various components of our program? These things are fine, but do a brush pass and get through them quickly. Because while all of these things are important, they're not that important uh, on here. And it's much more important to look at your program as an evolutionary process. Uh, again, when we look at it here, what would you rather get good at? Starting your data governance program when it occurs just once or executing on your gov governance program, which repeats continuously until your HR department goes away. Yes, get better at the things on the right-hand side and. Gosh, if it looks suspiciously like plan, do, check, act, it is. It is very much the way that you should go in those areas and not, in fact, spend a lot of time getting your organization started, but instead start executing on this. Another component that you have to think about in the process is data ethics, and that is going to be part of what goes on, particularly with the prevalence of, excuse me, prevalence of uh, AI starting to come in place. Recommend two books or a Netflix uh, uh, piece. The Netflix show is Coded Bias at the bottom, and uh, Joy Bulawami has done a great job in her book, Unmasking AI. Also, if you haven't had a chance to read it, it should be mandatory reading for all data governance professionals, and in fact, all knowledge workers, as far as I'm concerned, Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill. Uh, wonderful, wonderful techniques. Let's get to the last component of this, which is data governance storytelling. Absolutely key to be able to tell stories. Here's just a couple of them that are critically important. Uh, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation has a headline here that did put them in the most uh, favorable light. Oh my goodness. Uh, PennDOT makes millions selling your personal data isn't safe. Well, one version of the headline is PennDOT gets selling caught selling $40 million of uh, your data to insurance companies. Another equally valid headline might have been, PennDOT saves taxpayers $40 million by selling data legally derived from your data. In other words, they are allowed to sell it if it's been properly de-identified and anonymized. And it turns out the insurance companies aren't particularly good at using this data as well. Here's another example from the headlines that just has a very simple cost on it. $400 million penalty settled uh, by Citibank for failure to uh, lack data governance programs and internal controls. In addition to the $400 million, the Federal Reserve Board also took a separate action against Citigroup. So there was more money outside of the 400 million. And most importantly, Citibank was enjoined from doing any significant acquisitions until they cleared this up. So an awful lot of things got into place that didn't work out nearly as well for them. These stories are important for organizations to understand. It would be good to set a series of data governance minutes in your organization just so that people get aware of them. Here's another example. This was uh, NFTs, uh, again, clip art basically. But uh, uh, Jack Dorsey's original tweet, the very first one setting up his Twitter, originally sold for uh, $25 million uh, on this. And uh, he tried, the person who bought it, Estevani uh, here, tried to sell it uh, a couple of uh, years back. And he thought that he would uh, uh, be able to sell it for $48 million uh, and be able to help, uh, help out. Half the money would go to charity. The highest bid that he got for his stupid NFT was $280. So uh, not probably a good investment in there. Again, these are things that data governance can help your organization understand better how to do this. Let's take a couple more quick stories in here. The first one is about using the correct language. The language that you should use, this was a healthcare company on the West Coast that we worked with for a while, and they said data Getting access to data around here is like that Catherine Zeta-Jones scene where she's trying to get through all those lasers. 
you remember that movie. I think Sean Connery was her co-star in there. Uh, it made a lot of sense. It was a, a way of relating. That may not be appropriate for your organization, but it was perfectly appropriate for their organization. Barclays Bank, sorry, most of these are finance oriented, wanted to buy Lehman Brothers. Actually, they were told to buy Lehman Brothers when Lehman Brothers went out of business. And they went before the judge with a spreadsheet that said, uh, we're going to buy this stuff and the stuff we're not going to buy, we've hidden in the spreadsheet. 189 rows in that spreadsheet were hidden, but were accidentally purchased because a, a first year associate went home at midnight, reformatted the spreadsheet and unhid all the lines that were there. Consequently, when they closed, the judge came back and said, tough luck you're going to buy all of these 179 pieces. So as you might imagine, Barclays does an awful lot of work around data governance and spreadsheets in their organization. One last example here involving spreadsheets, uh, again, data governance wise, this was back during COVID, but nevertheless still relevant. They were using the wrong version of Excel. Why would a healthcare, ver healthcare professional have to understand what version of Excel they were supposed to use? And that meant that any rows that were added to the spreadsheet beyond 16,000 fell off the bottom of the spreadsheet, helping us unfortunately make the pandemic worse in order to do this. So I've told you a couple of stories here. I've told you a bunch of different things. Uh, data starts out with some confounding characteristics. It's uneven understanding in your organizations and in fact, across the world. It, this has led to fractured views of data and increasing amounts of organizational data debt. In order to make your governance program successful, you need to understand this is a young profession. It needs to be directly supportive of organizational strategy by improving data and its use in both the short and the long term in order to stay viable. The data governance must exist as a program in your organization to achieve effectiveness. It is central to data management and central to digitization efforts, and it must be decoupled from IT strategy, which is incompatibly project-driven. And finally, over here, we add to the process of cooking slowly. Start off with your ingredients, add digital and data dependent on high-speed automation, Pick a data governance framework that helps you to refine focus and then evolve your process into a plan, do, check, act cycle. You'll find a lot of organizational support in your organization to support it in this fashion. Our fourth ingredient then is storytelling. If you haven't got the ability to say, do you remember what happened to Citibank at the OCC? Do you remember what happened to Barclays? Do you remember when we lost all those COVID cases? Do you remember when we were, used to have data that we couldn't get except for uh, Catherine Dana Jones, or remember when NFTs were going to be a good investment. All of these are critical ways of talking about data in a way that everybody in the organization will understand these activities. I've included in here for you, as well as we head to our Q&A session, uh, a series of references in here, but let's do a couple of quick takeaways before we get to them. The need for data governance continues to increase because of the increases in data volume, the decreases in data quality, and the decreases in data knowledge. There's a lack of rigorous practice improvement in these areas, but data governance is, relatively speaking, a new discipline, at least compared to the 8,000 plus years that accounting has been around in order to do this. And that it must conform to your constraints of your organization. There is no one best way, in fact, most organizations, and it's been a very common comment I've gotten from chief data officers, uh, sure, we know how to do it. What we don't know how to do is how to work it in your organization, how to get your organization to where it is. You on this call are the best capable to be able to implement these things for your organization to help everybody in the organization understand this. And that by driving on these four key elements, keeping data governance practically focused on strategy. The purpose of data is to support the organizational strategy. The purpose of the organizational strategy is to keep the organization going. If you're not a profit-driven organization, substitute mission for money, and all of these words work exactly as well. And to implement data governance and data as a program, not as a project. It cannot succeed, it's too fragmented at that level to 
gradually add ingredients. Don't try to start out with a complex data piece like the Commonwealth of Virginia has done three times so far, and we are not very effective around this. I hate to tell stories on my colleagues, but they are true stories. And finally, learn the value of stories and storytelling in your organization. Because if you don't have the stories, people don't learn. The goal is to improve data governance, effectiveness and efficiencies, and of course the data itself over time. The more literate your organization is, the better it will be in terms of getting and achieving that transformation. I mentioned a couple of books. John Ladley's book on data governance is absolutely a bestseller in this area. He's at work on version three, but it won't be out this year. If you gotta get something now, grab his version two book couple of websites. One in particular, I mentioned Bob Siner. He's got this great uh, site called TDAN that is now part of the Dataversity family. Uh, good places to take a look at. I'll, again, these will be included in there. And uh, I've just got a new chapter in a new data governance initiative in an uh, academic topic. It's a fairly expensive book, so not quite as uh, inexpensive as some of these others here, but uh, by all means, how about them? And it's now time to turn it back over to Mark and see what sort of questions you guys have for all of us. We've got questions, we've got discussion points, we've got enough content here that we could do like three more webinars, I think. All right, Mark will be employed <laughs> for a while, right? Uh, yeah, it's, this is great. Um, I think uh, I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to, uh, because this showed up in the Q&A and, and all of us have been talking about this for, for a little while now. And and it uh, it's, it's fun to think about. I wanna hear your thoughts on it and then I might blather a bit too. Um, Given the rise of AI, do you include AI governance under the broad scope of data governance, or is it another but related activity? That's a great question. Let me jump back to the slide on that one. I know we've had some slides, actually, I had some uh, pre pre uh, webinar slide questions that came in about this. So, it I, I wanted to say it sort of doesn't matter as long as they're both done. But if you think about it, what is AI doing? It's learning from data. And if the data it's learning from is flawed, then it will have significant flaws in the AI. This was the whole purpose of Joy Bulawimi's book. Uh, again, she did a great job of it, but her, her uh, recognition, her, her insight, which was sort of obvious with hindsight, was that if you program uh, facial recognition algorithms and they're tuned to white male faces, then guess what? It'll recognize white male faces much better than it will recognize other types of faces. So I have seen many organizations successfully do data governance just as using data as an input into AI and saying, yes, absolutely. If you're not doing that aspect of it, your data governance efforts are fraught with peril. Uh, they're doing illegal things, bad, bad sorts of stuff that happens. That doesn't mean that your, your data scientists appreciating can I thinking uh, should be replaced by should I thinking. And some people do break that out as a separate AI governance piece. But to me, that's kind of like trying to manage your information separate from your data. Yes, they are distinct components, but it's generally more trouble than it's worth. So I would include them together. Mark, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I I think we're kind of in sync here, Peter. And I, I've been thinking about this for uh, months now. Well, actually not months, or just over a year even. Um, and, and ultimately, I think that AI governance is really just governance under a different name. The context is what what's changing here. Um, ultimately, when we talk about AI uh, and the hunger that that folks have to govern AI is really about the policies, procedures and guidelines that uh, create the rules of engagement for the use of AI at your organization, whether that's generative AI or something else. Um, from a technology standpoint, we're we're, we'd all be uh, good to remember that AI is essentially an agent. So each each thing that AI does, it does that one thing. It learns that one thing, and and it does that one thing quite well. This is why when you create an image with like something like Dolly, and tell it to generate me a poster that says this, it doesn't know how to spell the words. It's that's not its job. It's to generate a poster that looks like something that has those words on it which is why it can't spell. 
so there's a lot of interesting things to think about there. Um, I think our, our natural inclination is to separate them out. Uh, but I don't think that's necessarily true. I think they're very similar functions and, and AI governance could be part of data governance or it could be, uh, uh, or the data governance team could be an important aspect of it. But yeah, like this is something I could talk about forever as well, Peter. Absolutely. Because we have to move to our next question though. <laughs> we do, we do, yeah. Um, if you don't have any data governance program, uh, can you start a, a data warehouse initiative without data governance? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Right. I mean, yes, you can. And and more importantly, you'll probably spend a lot more money than you perhaps were thinking or, or get a lot less value out of it in that process. So if you are not managing your data with guidance, it means you're letting somebody say, oh, sure, we'll build a warehouse and we'll fill it up with stuff. Uh, Mark, I'll tell you a story. Uh, I spent the summer of 1993 in the basement of the U.S. Pentagon shoveling bad data into a data dictionary because somebody promised an executive somewhere that there would be 17,000 data elements in the data dictionary by August 17th. I'm not sure why the alliteration mattered, but I was ducky on that. And uh, I can tell you it was a complete waste of the, the taxpayer's money because most of the data that we shoved into that uh, was shoved in without any guidance because they were counting on measuring. They weren't counting on quality. Uh, so rather than creating a data warehouse, what I would suggest to organizations is you instead find a SQL Server developer in your organization. Everybody has a copy of SQL Server out there and just build a data collection and use it as a warehouse and see what happens. Once again, we go back to my ROT principle, which says that minimally 20% of, excuse me, maximally 20% of your data in the data warehouse is ever even accessed. Now, should you store it on the chance that it might be accessed? Yes, absolutely. But at the same time, you'd be amazed at how many data warehouses I've looked at and found that they contain within them duplicative data, redundant data, trivial data, that it was of no use to store in the first place and a complete waste of time and organizational efforts. Once again, Mark, I'll ask you that, that question too. Do you think that's the same type of thing? Sure, you can do it, but... Sure, you can do it, but there's going to be some extra steps that you got, you got to take along the way because you're going to need some of the the features and and foundations of data governance and the roles in your, in, that are typical in a data governance program to be able to launch a data warehouse initiative. So you may create those roles and start the vestis, vestiges of a data governance program just on the way, but... You, so you can, but it's going to take extra work. There's a uh, quote, again, I go back to Tom DeMarco, where he was asked once, you know, if you're developing these data products, can't you do it faster? He said, yes, I can develop it. I can do it faster. But if I do, it will take longer. If I do it faster, <laughs> it will decrease the quality. If I do it faster, yeah. it will increase the risk. And let's look at it from this sort of IPO diagram here as well. If we're putting inputs into a data warehouse and they are simply ungoverned, what is the value of the outputs that come out of it? Uh, again, I mentioned earlier, you guys can see me anywhere in the United States. We see a car that has GIGO on it. It's probably me. Garbage in, garbage out. The, the, the same questioner uh, asked, can you start a data warehouse initiative with data governance? Well, of Which course. Is... Yeah, of course. I, think I, I gave an example of that uh, in there. Yeah. So again, if you go back to the Dimbach here, the idea is that these aren't standalone pieces, but that if you're doing something along the lines of a warehousing activity, it's probably going to consist of some pieces of this, some pieces of this, and some pieces of this. So I've outlined three wedges on that Dimbach and said these are areas to concentrate on. In fact, your process of producing the warehouse will probably include those and some metadata and probably some reference and master data in the process as well. I've always, Peter, liked to say that it's um, that you're creating a focus area for your data governance program or or that there's a focus area involved here, which is the same thing that you're saying, just with different Absolutely. words. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So don't, don't try and focus your governance program broadly. Concentrate small and add ingredients. Um, well said, Mark. I agree with you. 
Uh, there was a great thread that started in chat that I'd like to get your um, your thoughts on and and some of your your wisdom on, um, and uh, and it was worded as follows. One important perspective we've seen is that when we talk about people problems, we often forget that the leadership team is a part of the people, and that is what where we often need to start. What are your thoughts around um, communicating with the with the people at the top? It's a really good observation. And I'll just pop this chart up here just so that everybody can be reminded of the fact that in organizations, as we've surveyed them literally over a decade, there have always been far more people and process problems than there have been technology problems. And yet organizations tend to start out by approaching data governance as a technology uh, as a solution to data governance as being a technology, and that is simply the wrong way to go. Uh, the reason for that is because the executives also are not data literate. I have another talk that you do that, uh, Mark, you and I have uh, talked about in the past, where when we look at what happens when knowledge workers are given an opportunity to do something around data that requires literacy, half of them ignore the problem. Now, that's a really scary statistic, but unfortunately, the same survey done by Accenture and Click, so a very reputable survey, you can find the results at the uh, dataliteracyproject.org, uh, do in fact find that that number increases when you go up into management, and that two-thirds of managers, when confronted with the data analysis problem, will ignore the problem and solve it some other way. I'm not sure what other way that would be, but it's not a good, happy result in most cases. So data literacy education of your executives is clearly something that you should invest in before you go in and have them start making decisions about time, money, and budget uh, around all of that. Yeah, that, well, we've heard this from so many folks, Peter, uh, over the years. Uh, this has been a common refrain when we talk about data literacy. One of the strategies that I've employed in the past is uh, uh, just sending out newsletters um, and just real brief, like two pagers, always with like a joke or something on the back, very light read. Um, and then over time, the readership of that uh, grew to the executive so that the uh, that everybody in the organization was learning something light and approachable about data once a month is how often I'd send these out. Um, but any little thing that you can do uh, to get people excited about and thinking about data is going to improve that literacy um, um, barrier. Excellent point, Mark. Uh, one other piece before we jump off of this topic, too, is that when we do measure executive self-reporting on this, I'm very confident that when I sit around a table of executives, I can look them in the eye and say that four out of five of you would pay me under the table to make you more literate. Let's just do it as a group. It's a whole lot cheaper for you. That's a good line, Peter. I'm going to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a friend here in, in the Q&A. Uh, who has this question that um, that we've tackled before, uh, Peter, but I, I just, uh, I love talking about it. So I'm, we're going to give it a go. Uh, we have a couple thousand application systems. How do we govern the enterprise information architecture as a whole? It's a non-trivial problem. Uh, I will tell you that uh, one of my biggest challenges that I ever faced uh, was in the early 90s as we were starting to get ready for uh, Y2K in the Department of Defense, we actually mapped all of those thousands of systems. Uh, so uh, it's not a trivial process, uh, but it can be done. And we achieved some very significant results, resulting in something that was originally called the DOD Integrated Process and Data Model. Now it's known as DODAF. Uh, the, the key to this is the what we call a triage approach. Uh, when you have that many systems, and, and by the way, just so that you can feel your pain, uh, there's a, a logistics company that I, I'm familiar with as well, uh, who has discovered they need to change the primary key for customer in more than 140,000 systems. Uh, so these are numbers that organizations can deal with. And by the way, you all as customers will never know this because these guys are pretty good with what they do. But what it comes down to is triage. Are there systems in there that you definitely need to manage their data and that's crucial to what goes on? Yes, absolutely. 
are there systems also in there that no matter what you do to them, they're going to either be gone in a couple of years or they're never going to produce any significant results? Once again, yes. So now you've divided your data into three piles. Definitely need, definitely don't need, and some stuff in the middle. And that stuff in the middle is going to require you to develop some techniques to go in and quickly and easily figure out which of the two piles they should get put into, or what is the good stuff in those systems that needs to be extracted and perhaps consolidated. Let's do one other bit of numbers around that. When organizations determine that they're going to consolidate from, let's just say, five zeros worth of systems to four zeros worth of systems, or maybe even three zeros worth of systems, only half the systems that they plan to get rid of actually go away. So unless you're really, really good at that process, you have to take a different approach from the way most organizations are taking it. Mark, did you see any of those kind of discussions going on last week at GGIQ? I did not see too many that were focused on it, but it is relatively common. Um, I, you know, I, I, I end up talking to somebody who's, who's got that problem, uh, every, every event, <laughs> uh, because that, that mountain of challenge, especially when you're starting a data governance program and all you see is the system count, uh, it can be so daunting and, and heartbreaking and where do you, where do you even begin? So, um, I, I do hear it, um, pretty much every event <laughs> to some degree. There is a uh, which wonderful... is why I love asking and talking about that question. Absolutely. There's a wonderful book out there by Melissa Cook. You can look mm -hmm. it up on Amazon. And she's written the technical approach to changing the systems. Also, I believe Ed Jordan had a, a uh, uh, migrating legacy systems book uh, that were out there. Uh, both of those were good guidance on the technical aspects. Neither of them talks about your process of sorting those systems into categories and say, yes. No, and maybe. And uh, again, even if you can get that type of a categorization on it, it's usually pretty helpful. So we, we, we do have a lot more questions. And and um, uh, here's one uh, that's pretty interesting. Too often I hear of data governance being thought of as the traditional master data management. How can we educate our leaders that modern data governance is different uh, than what we think of as traditional data governance? So there's a couple of topics in there. That's a good, good observation. And the real key, though, is to remember that data governance is personal to your organization. So your organization may look at data governance and see that reference and master data are going to be a heavy component of it, in which case that's perfectly appropriate. However, uh, other organizations have different uh, challenges that are there, uh, some that are much more of a document and content managed focused uh, I had one organization, Mark, I worked for that had 2,000 data warehouses. <laughs> you know, you just sort of get a number like that and go, 2,000 data warehouses. They kept uh, a colleague of mine employed for about five years as they got down from 2,000 data warehouses to fewer than 20. Uh, you know, what, what kind of silliness was going on that would cause the organization? Now, I, I, I will say there were some good reasons. They, they, grew by acquisition, so they inherited a lot of these, but they also were maintaining at one point in time more than 2,000 data warehouses. So that's going to be a very different focus of data governance. But in terms of educating people, I would come back to this diagram here that I have on the screen and say, look, data governance and the data management profession includes these topic areas. And that while data uh, reference and master data is one, it's not the only one. And you may find that there are other ways of adding value to it. For example, if you're looking at the ETL streams, many people are now saying that data engineering should actually be a uh, governed process uh, in there. And that goes back to the, the charts that I showed you on uh, the garbage in, garbage out, uh, where so many organizations are sending the same piles of data back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And it's just a silly, silly waste of time and money. <laughs> I yeah, just I totally agree with you, Peter. And 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 this goes back to our our mutual friend Gwen Thomas, um, and the Data Governance Institute always taught that a data governance program needs a focus area, and it's so true. Um, uh, whenever I go into an organization, I would often ask, you know, why did you bring me here? What is the, oh, 
That's perfect. Why did you bring me here? What is the what is the driving need for data governance at your organization? Uh, lately, there's been some data security uh, discussions in there. Um, we need help because data breach, uh, and 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 that's a a real risk factor for folks. And so you end up with a a data governance uh, program. Uh, that's uh, built around working with the data security team and finding the roles and accountabilities and decision rights related to uh, that part of the business. In the end, a data governance program will uh, eventually grow to uh, handle all parts of the of of, uh, of the DM bot wheel, um, but uh, it grows with an institution over time, um, which is why your analogy, Peter, of you know what's this this data management stuff? Is it? It's like HR. Um, are you done managing your data? Are you done managing your people? Um, uh, I've, I've I've referenced that several times in my career. And and it was so good to see Gwen at the event last week. Uh, she I think is uh, let me know that she's in the process of updating this. So you may want to reach out to her and mm -hmm. uh, get her latest version of it. But absolutely, that was one of her keys. If you don't have a focus, and, and Marcus is one of my favorite customers I ever worked for, a Canadian group, and we worked for them for about two years on data governance initiatives and kept trying to say, hey, what, what are the priorities? Finally got a hold of management who said after two years, well, you know, we haven't made any money in three years. It's like, oh, it's a place I'd start, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just, I'm not sure why it took us two years to get there, but gosh, at least we got there. It's a great segue question. Uh, does data governance or data stewards have any responsibility for monitoring how data is being used by data consumers? Yes. You can go first on that one if you want. I'm going to grab a slide while you're... <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I would say yes. I'm, I'm a huge fan of uh, Bob Siner's non-invasive framework. Um, I've just found a lot of success with that over the years. Um, but basically, that entire That's framework that is all about... Interject. Yeah, exactly. Um, but this this framework's all about uh, understanding what it is people are doing already and formalizing that. Uh, but uh, in that world, a data steward definitely has the responsibility for for monitoring how data is being used by the consumers. The the consumers have a responsibility to to know that the data that they're using is quality, and and if it's not quality, cycle back. Yeah, I, all these back and forth arrows are. are are absolutely perfect. Everybody has a relationship to data and, and we're talking about formalizing that. And notice the word data business goals is up there twice. So mm -hmm. you should express your data strategy in terms of business goals and your data stewards deliverables and objectives should be expressed in concrete business goals because if they don't, it becomes abstract and then people eventually say, why are we going to these meetings? Which is not the question you want to hear. Mm -mm. <laughs> Hey Mark, have you ever seen the uh, the the Hotel California, which is called Data Governance Hell or something like that? Somebody made a a, a video uh, on YouTube. You can Google it. It's a uh, oh my God, data governance is hell. It's just terrible meetings and all sorts of stuff. And it's all done to the tune of Hotel California. Uh, that's a great analogy. I haven't seen that. I'll look it up after. Uh, but it just leads me to 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 thinking, you know, different data stewards fighting about their data silos, just like the the band members of the Eagles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll get ourselves sued by Don Henley if we're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> the data of summer. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, there's just so much in chat here. Um, how to make an enterprise, how do you make an enterprise data quality program add value to the business? We have data quality rules and profiles, but how do you identify a business problem and use a DQ program to tackle that? Um, and, I, and I ask that because, first of all, I love talking about data quality, uh, but uh, how much it depends on data governance is, is always uh, a fascinating discussion. It sounds like the cart was slightly before the horse there. I would do just the opposite. I would find a business problem and find how data governance can help solve the business problem because the business problem already has a value. Somebody's complaining about it. Something needs to be faster, better, cheaper, or less risky, and it's costing us time and money or aspects of the mission. Uh, I'll give you a, a non-dollar cost example on this one. 
uh, one of our service delivery organizations in the Commonwealth of Virginia had a, a group that would go into a household and try to find a, um, uh, try to make a triage decision of, do I take the child out of the house because it's in danger? Or do I give everybody a fine and tell them they've all got to appear in front of the judge next week? Or is there really nothing going on? It was a false, false alarm. That's sort, of sort of the three main conclusions. But that conclusion was reached by going through an 80 question questionnaire. So 80 questions took an hour to complete this questionnaire. And at the end, there was a score and then the decision would be made. Uh, we were able through a data governance effort to analyze the value of the data collected by those questions and found out that fully 40% of them, excuse me, 40 of them, half of them were absolutely not useful at all. And two important things happened. One, the time to do the questionnaire went from an hour to 30 minutes. And as a result of that hour to 30 minutes conversion, we were able to change a million dollars from administration of the program to service delivery of that program. And that's an important outcome, not just for taxpayers, but also for children. And so it was a, a super, super good cogent example of that. Yes, try to find ways of getting better. At it. It's not that we can't do it. It's been hard because it hasn't been a focus. Uh, I mentioned before the book, uh, uh, how to measure anything by Douglas Hubbard is a great place to get started there. Again, if that's not clear, hit me up afterwards. I'm happy to, to chat and point you in the right direction for those. I love this slide, Peter. Um, and I, whenever talking about data quality, I always talk about critical data elements. Uh, mm -hmm. What are the things that are actually driving your business? I like how you frame this because you're talking about actual business problems. I think what we see a lot right now in, in some thought leadership online and some content online is a uh, discussion around a data quality program where you just turn it on and then it does all this profiling of your data and tells you how bad your data is, tells you to find a steward for something. And then that's that steward's responsibility to fix the, the completeness or accuracy or validity of that data. And, and Hey, we probably live in a world where not all of those things matter at that point in time. And it's so easy in data quality to try and boil the ocean and do way too much, especially when uh, folks are out there saying, yeah, just do all these things and it'll be easy peasy and your data quality will be spectacular. And you just end up with a mountain of cleansing to do that is just not reasonably practicable under any situation. So Mark, let me, let me finish up here perhaps with a story that'll help also the, the person that had the thousands of legacy systems uh, that were in place. My, uh, my job at the defense department in one of my previous incarnations as a federal employee was uh, the U.S. Department of Defense Reverse Engineering Program Manager. So what a great title, right? But one of the things that we were tasked with doing was figuring out what was the most efficient path to Y2K success. And in order to do that, we created a data flow diagram of how data flowed through the entire Department of Defense. It's kind of like this map here showing a little bit of you know, what's going on in terms of the complexities and, and everything around that. But once we had done this map, uh, uh, you know, we were of course able to look and say, where should we do the remediation efforts? Where are they gonna be most effective? Because of course we wanted to change this data instead of that data uh, because it would be more effective use of taxpayer money and also of course limited resources that we had as defense department uh, folks. But uh, I got a, I got a, knock on the door pretty soon after we had completed the diagrams and there were the folks from the three letter agencies and they were saying, Hey, we heard you made these maps. And I said, I guess, and you're here because you want a copy of them. Right. And they said, wrong. We're here because we want all your copies of them. <laughs> uh, that was over hilarious. my clearance at the time. And so of course <laughs> I complied and, Pass them on, but yes, this stuff can be extremely valuable. And the fact that the the agencies understood this was really, really great. Um, your organizations hopefully will appreciate the same way your initiatives are also helping the organization to get faster, better, cheaper, or less risky as part of the process. Awesome. Well, 
what a great story to to end our our presentation on. Thank you, Peter, for this great presentation in Q and A. That's all we have time for today. Just to remind everybody, we will be posting the recorded webinar and slides to dataversity.net within a couple of business days, and we'll send out a follow up email to let you know the links and any other requested information throughout today's webinar. Thank you again, everybody, for attending today's webinar, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Mark, a pleasure to work with you as always. I'll look forward to the next one. Thanks, Peter. You as well. Cheers, everybody.